I'm working on here is a demonstration piece that I did for a friend of mine who wanted some of his backdrop painted. Uh, when Darrell came to me and said he wanted to know how I did pine trees, I pulled this out. and So we're actually starting at this point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come along through here and I'm going to do the underpainting for pine trees. Um, and I'm using Hooker's Green and, a, and Payne's Gray to make a rather dark green that will be that will be the underpainting color. Okay, so and I'm using a number 10 bristle brush and I'm just scrubbing this back and forth up and down. I hope you can see that struck, yeah. Daryl. Yeah. Um, just to give the illusion of some trees in the background and I need to pick up a little bit more paint. Here it is. Doing this on your backdrop is very fast. You can cover a good distance in a fair amount of time. And I'm not being real careful about how I mix it. I just want it to have a real dark green look to it. Now we're just going to come in through here and do this. And this stroke that I'm doing just gives the illusion of tree trunks behind us. So you're not painting brown tree trunks. You're just no. you're just going right with the, the uh, green with the the brown mixed with yeah. it. What actually what you're what you're picking up is the tops of trees more so than the trunks themselves. It's the top of the of the pine tree. And I'm not going to come up into this meadow that I painted because I don't want to I don't want to kill that. That was the nice part about the uh, about the demonstration. So I'm just pulling this color down and just covering that blue that was on there. Now, after you put in this base coat, do you let it dry before you come back with the, yes. the highlights? Yeah, we're going to let this dry. And it, it's actually not a highlight, uh, Daryl, that we're going to do on this. What we're going to do right over the top of this is we're going to start painting individual trees. Okay. So, in essence, what this is is just an underpainting. It'll, it'll be dry in just a couple of minutes. Now that meadow area that you did there, 
Yeah. Uh, did that just work out that way, or did you plan it that way? Uh, uh, is that water there, or is it just a light color area? Or? No, what happened was, when I painted this, I looked at it and I said, boy, that would be a wonderful area to have a little creek or a river coming through. Uh -huh. And I was playing around adding highlights to it, and I accidentally hit that spot with the yellow, and I liked it. So yeah, yeah. I, I just kept working it, uh -huh. and I worked it out until it just looks like a little meadow. That would be a perfect place for a little creek or a river. Right. Right. And I probably will change that at some point because I, I use this on the door on my layout now. And if I change it, add a little bit of water, and then add a little bit of a lake scene right in here, mm -hmm. it'll be it'll be just perfect. Very good. Well, it's a very nice painting. Thank you. Is I'm using some raw umber here, and some white gesso. I'm mixing it together and making it nice and fluid, so that I could now start to make the trunks of the trees. Now what we're going to do is we're going to make about eight or nine trees right in right in this area here just so you can see the process but we'll start off with making eight or nine tree trunks and I'm going to start them up just a little bit from the bottom so that we can paint in the under foliage and bushes and stuff like that and what I do is I start low and I just make a long straight stoke up like that come over here make another one you notice I didn't go as high. I'm trying to keep the shape of the trees varying between high and low. And you'll notice that if the paint is, is nice and wet, it just flows nicely off the brush. Just like that. And let's see, one, two, three, four, nine. We'll put one more in. We'll put a low one in right, maybe right there. Okay, now I'm washing off that brush to get all the paint out of it. Setting it back down. And we're going to work with uh, these brushes today. We're going to try some new brushes and see how they work doing the, uh, yeah, the new brush is a, uh, is a fan brush and it's part of that set of 12 brushes I bought this morning from Lowell Cornell for $4.99. Um, and I was very excited about that because uh, it's very unusual to see brushes that cheap. And I'm thinking that I might run back there and just buy a whole bunch more. I think of fan brushes is costing about six or seven dollars each. Oh yeah, I have, I have fan brushes that I've paid up to thirteen dollars for. Yeah, yeah. So at any rate, what I'm doing now is I'm setting down that second fan brush and I'm going to set down this paint right here. And I'm going to come along and working left to right, I'm going to start doing the very tops of the trees. I just want to see how these brushes are going to work. I'm, I'm not sure about them yet because I, I haven't tried using them, but it seems to be working out okay. Paint needs to be a little wetter. I may have to change the angle on these two. The angle's a little bit straight, but we'll see. Now, by the angle being a little straight, I, I mean the angle on the on the, on on the, the angle on the brush is very straight across. I, okay. may, I okay. may have to make a little oh, rounded a bit, at the rounded okay. just a touch. Yeah, yeah. See, I'm not happy with that. Yeah. Well, if you're like I am, I know you find your favorite brushes that you like to work with, and you tend to use them all the time. That's exactly what. New I do. ones take a little while to get used to. Yeah, and what I'm doing here is I'm just kicking in some of these upper branches with this like that so that you can just start to see the upper branches of the of the pine trees. 
Now when you're painting those branches, are you using a, a sideways motion with that or well, are you just pressing the, the brush uh, right against and... and I, I really like to dab. I really uh -huh. like to dab. Whoops. Oops. I really like to dab. Uh, and if I can dab, I will. Uh, but these areas right here, this brush right here is not really allowing me to dab, so I'm kind of making a little sideways stroke. And I actually, I think I'm going to change brushes. I'm going to go to mine. Okay. I may come back to, I may come back to this brush because it's a nice size. Um, these are the two brushes that I generally use. The, well, what I've done is I've cut off the edges here and here so that the brush is this shape. Right. But it's and still very skinny and very flat. Right. Yeah. So now I've wet the brush. I'm putting it into my mixture here. I'm going to get my spritzer and wet this paint up again. Put it in over here. I'm doing what I call loading the brush right now. And by loading the brush, I mean I'm putting enough paint on the brush that it'll hold the bristles together. More or less like that. And then I can start coming along and putting the dabs of paint on the backdrop. When the, when the brush is working for you, which this one's doing a fairly nice job of right now, you can see how the tops of those trees look almost like the tops of fir trees or um, they don't look like necessarily a brush stroke. Okay. You know, whereas that looks a little bit heavy to me. I'm going to use this one, come that way and that way. And then I'm switching here. I'm sorry that's hard for you to get in and see, I know. Not holding together. Now by holding together you mean you need more paint in your brush? I, well, I, what I need is I need the bristles to hold together for me so that I can do just the touch and dab that I need to do. And it just... So far the best one was this one right here. Okay. Now you work, you're just working down the trunk, you're not trying to paint brushes on the left hand side of the trunk and no. then on the right hand side. You're just no. giving the representation of them as you go down. I, that's what I'm trying to do, yeah. Okay. And, and in this case what I'm doing is using the brush and just making little sideways strokes. This one here will be much better because it's up in, up in a light area and you'll be able to see it. I hope you can see what I'm doing here. What I'm doing is working the left side and then the right side, adding branches as I, as I come down. And I'm trying to make them unequal in length as I do that. Mm -hmm. So you paint the top portion of the trees and you're working your way across and painting right. the tops of all of them and then you're going to switch to a larger brush? Is then that I'm right? going to switch to a larger brush uh -huh. and I'm going to then continue the uh, stroke that I'm making going downward with the larger brush. And you'll see how the, you'll see how the shape of the tree actually developed as I do that. These trees that are up here in this light area make it really easy for you to see what I'm doing. I'm not going to do that. It's down there in the dark. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to switch brushes. And I'm going to try this, uh, this other brush, this other new one that I bought. It's a little bit bigger and I 
kind of like the shape of it. Now we're going to work with two or three different fan brushes doing this. But what we're going to do, now see that's not dark enough, sorry. <clears throat> I need more of Payne's Gray. There it is. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're pulling down the green and we're pulling into it the gray, making it a nice dark undercover. Like that. I'm happy with that. That's a nice, a relatively nice dark dark green. I need to get a hook or something where I can just put a towel in here. I thought it worked pretty good in your pants the other day. Yeah, you had it in your but pocket. I, and I started there and it, it ended up coming out, you know. Yeah. Now what you can see now is I'm taking this green and this brush is working out pretty good. I'm just kind of working it back and forth. In kind of a zigzag motion as I come down the tree. The next step is that I've switched to a larger fan brush. This is actually my favorite fan brush. It's not part of that set. This is a Bob Ross fan brush. And as much as I laughed at the idea of it being a special brush from Bob Ross, it actually ended up being a very, very good brush for doing this type of work. It has a very nice flow to it. It's got extra thick bristles and it does a nice job. And what I find is that if I if I have a brush that works, I stick with it. The first fan brush that I had that I really liked I got from uh, I think it was standard brand paints or something like that a long, long time ago. And I, I lost it and it was really really very upset when I lost it because I never thought I'd be able to replace it with anything until I got this uh, this Bob Ross. Now what I'm doing here is painting on this basic undercoat of color for these trees. I'm doing a, a zigzag a Z motion it's a very dark color that I'm putting down and the reason for the dark color is because we're going to come along over the top of that and we're going to highlight it with a couple of different colors. And that will bring that tree right out into the, into the foreground where it belongs. You can see I'm just zigzagging that color down. Okay. The next color that we're going to, be, we're going to use is going to be chromium oxide green. Okay, we've let this dry so that we can now put the second coat on top of here. And using my small fan brush, I'm going to start highlighting the very tops of the trees that we've painted before. Okay, I can't quite can't see Can't quite yours. see me. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to move myself over. 
And what I'm doing is I'm trying to paint this on in such a way that you can still see the the dark color that I painted on there, but this kind of highlights it. So are you trying to put it at the top, just well, over the top, or right on it? And yes. Um, I, what I'm trying to do is just set it on top so that it's just almost blocking out that, that first color, but not totally blocking it out. Okay. I want you to be able to see the dark color come through that. Okay. So. And I'm trying to back off a little bit so that I'm not blocking that t totally. Unfortunately, the, the brush is not cooperating with me right now. See how the brush is splitting? Right, right. Okay, so now I'm going to continue working the very, very tip tops of these trees with this brush. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm using a little sideway motion on that one because it, it, uh, it's not working the way I want it to. It's holding together pretty good right now, so I'm doing this. And I'm kind of just tipping my way down a little bit, not not all the lot too far because I'm going to switch to a bigger brush. Now it seems to be working better. Nope. Well, I can see that brush is split, but you're just having to use one half of the split. That's what's that? happening, yeah. yeah okay. There's a lot of detailed painting that goes into painting this type of tree. You're doing several different steps. And if you'll notice, what I'm doing is I'm leaving at least one tree dark back here. Because what we want to do is we want to have some of the trees be darker and some of the trees be lighter as we paint so that it looks like some are further back into the forest than the others. Sorry about that, it's right up there in front of me now. Okay. Now I'm going to switch brushes, go to my Bob Ross, which I told you about earlier. I'm going to load Bob up. And we're going to come right here with this and start this zigzag motion with this brush. See how nicely that brush works? It just makes a real nice appearance of fir or pine or something like that. Now is that a fairly soft brush or is that pretty stiff brush? Well it's a, it's a fairly stiff brush but if you just use it with a, with a light touch it does a really 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 nice job.
Yep, when you find it, it works beautifully. And what happens now is that the dark area behind the tree starts to look like the depth of the forest behind it. So you want to leave that nice and dark in there. This is more of the same color? Yeah, this is more of the same color. I'm just going to use this brush to do this last little tree here that uh, is sitting here. This is the one that you didn't do any of the dark branches right. on. Right. There was enough dark behind it that okay. I, didn't, okay. I didn't worry about it. Okay, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to let this dry. Okay. Okay. Now the next step is that we're going to come back here and we're going to highlight these trees. And we're going to highlight them so that what they'll have is a little indication of sunlight on them. Now, is this a different yeah. color? Yes, this is the, the chromium oxide green and I've added to that um, some of the cadmium yellow light. Okay. And this, okay. So now we're just going to come along here and got a little bit too much paint on that. I'm going to wipe off some of the paint, wipe off that, and now we're going to come along here and just do some real light highlighting on this. Just wanting the paint to just touch this and flow off of it. So. Now does this continue down the whole tree? Um, yeah, but we're only going to use this little brush on the top portions okay. of the tree. Okay. We just want to be real, real careful with this brush because it puts a lot of paint on and you don't want to get it real thick. This is more the way you'd want it to be. I'm going to leave this tree dark and I'm going to come over here. You can see how the paint's just drying up almost immediately and I'm having to spritz it to keep it wet. Now I'm switching to the larger fan brush, the one that I like, and I'm just going to come over here and very, very, very lightly touch this with this fan brush. Very, very lightly, because as the tree comes down, it's getting, receiving probably less and less light. And what happens is each layer of paint that goes on this creates another layer of depth for the tree and it ends up making the forest look deeper as it goes.
See how light some of them are, and then mm -hmm. dark, and then... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then we take the brush, and we just kind of clean out the brush on here, like this. That creates your foreground. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to spread some of this paint around, just to lighten it up. And I'm going to add a little bit of yellow to it. Let that blend in like that. Now that makes a nice ground color. And then what we can do along with that is come back with... I want to be careful which brush I use. It's too big. We want to come back with something like this number number six round and I'm going to come back and pick up this green actually I think I want to go to a darker green because of what we're doing well I'm going to come back in and I'm going to pick up this hooker's green and I'm going to add Some little dabs of paint in here. It's kind of like this. And what this is going to do is this is going to create some areas that have bushes in them in front of the trees. And on top of that, Hooker's Green, I'm going to come along and pick up some of this yellow. crush that onto the palette like I showed you before and we're just going to hit this in here like so and make some yellow bushes in there do is I want to come back and pick up some of the hooker's green and blend that into the brush like that and then just come back and soften some of these areas in through here like so. There you go. Now you have fairly nice looking for foreground bushes. There you go. Okay. Not hard to do. And what I'm going to do now is come back below the bushes with the chromium oxide green and some of the yellow again. stand out. So it looks like you have foreground hills and trees and stuff like that. Very good. Before I start, I have a question for the group, and the question is, how many people actually have painting experience? Okay, I know Bill does, and how much painting experience do you have? In the roller camera? Not, 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 not a tremendous amount. I've taken some uh, Bob Ross classes. Okay, good. good. Uh, you, you're overqualified, probably. And who was the other person here? Was it you, Bill? Okay. And how about you? How much experience have you had painting? Well, I do dioramas. So okay. Landscape diorama? Uh, well, just dioramas, miniatures, diorama. Okay. 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 Good. Um, 
So what I what we're going to do then? We'll talk just briefly about materials, and we'll talk just briefly about magazines and stuff that you can get to assist you in uh, in your endeavors if you choose to try. To do a backdrop painting. Um, there's a guy that I absolutely love. He's got nine books out in a series. His name is Yarnell, um, Jerry Yarnell. And this particular book here is a book on basics. And he's got books that take you all the way through the whole process, like learning process of painting. He talks about composition. He talks about light. He talks about color. He talks about almost anything that you you would need in terms of, of painting, uh, a, a backdrop for your model railroad. Uh, I recommend his books very highly. I've got them sitting here. If you want to take a look at them, feel free. Uh, there's a couple other books that I have. Uh, <clears throat> this particular book is an excellent book. It says how to paint trees, flowers, and foliage. But what you don't see here is that he talks about something very important to model railroaders, and that is he talks about painting distance space, he talks about painting mid-ground space, and he talks about painting foreground space. And when you're doing your backdrops, or if you decide to do a backdrop on a model railroad, uh, probably the most important element that you're going to put on your backdrop is going to be your trees. If you nail your trees, then you're going to have a great backdrop. And it doesn't matter. Because your, your backdrops don't have to be incredible works of art. But all they have to do is to adequately give the illusion of something going on. And the thing that will assist in that illusion is what you do with your foreground trees. So, very, very important. The name? Just an awful name. Here you go. Patricia. Here you go. Just take, take a look. Take it, pass it around. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of different techniques today. Most of the tech, most of the clinics that I've given have been like uh, beginner backdrops, and I've done that so many times I decided I didn't want to do it again. So today we're going to do a little bit, uh, a little bit more advanced stuff, and I'm going to show you some techniques that you probably haven't seen before. One of the most important things when you're doing painting, regardless if you're doing backdrops on a model railroad or landscape paintings on the wall is there's a process called underpanning. And underpanning is what really sets the, the tone of the work that you're going to do. So that's what we're going to start with. And I'm going to use a very interesting piece of material. A piece of Kleenex. Not Kleenex, actually. It's a paper towel. So here we go. What I did was I made a sketch here. And on the sketch, I, I put areas that I thought I wanted to have in shadow or to be a little bit darker than the rest of it. So what's going to happen is I'm just going to come through here. Is that water on spray? That's water on spray. Yeah. And it it's so dry and hot in here. It just stuff is drying up almost instantly. Okay, and now what I did was I used a, uh, a burnt umber to do an, an under underpainting of that or an undercoating. And now I'm going to do, and that was for the stuff that's a little bit in the background. And now for the foreground, I'm going to use another color, which is burnt sienna. And the burnt sienna I'm going to use in these areas here. And the purpose for the burnt sienna. is to give a little bit different tone in the foreground areas. Okay. So that doesn't look like much, but that basically is an underpainting, undercoating. And I need that. Uh, okay. It's all right.
Thanks, Daryl. Okay, I'm going to let that dry just for a second. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start putting the base color on. Okay? I'll let you see what I'm doing. I'm taking this chromium oxide green, putting it on here, taking a little bit of burnt umber, putting it on, adding some white gesso, and what that does is it creates kind of a brownish green color. And I'm hoping this is dry because Can you explain your brush? I'm sorry, what? Can you explain your brush and what you're doing? Can I explain the brush? Okay. Um, this is a, uh, a number 10 flat bristle brush. It's a, uh, you know what? I can't tell you what a bristle brush is. It's a hair brush. And most brushes are either like these, which are made out of nylon, or these that are made out of bristle for. Um, for acrylic paints, I tend to like the bristle brushes better. Uh, for some reason, they seem to work better. And the other thing that goes on with, with um, acrylic paints doing backdrops, the cheaper the brush, generally the better the brush. Uh, <laughs> you know, the brushes that I absolutely love are these ones like this right here. They're a, a low Cornell Scholastic Bristol. You can buy this brush for a dollar at like Michael's or Aaron Brothers or something like that. Thank you all very much for coming. It was a pleasure doing this for you. <laughs>
same one and it's a bit too strong, so I'm pulling it out. Set it out with water and stuff? Well, actually, that was water and, and white gesso that I put on there. Okay. What does the gesso help you? Well, the gesso has two functions. One is that it, it, it's white, so it lightens the paint. But the other thing is, is that the gesso, rather than water, is a little bit slower drying. And I like to use it. It makes the acrylic paints a little bit more like, and not anywhere near like oil, but they're a little bit more like oil. They just dry slower, you can blend with them. And in this room, I don't know. The next color that I'm using is yellow okra, and I use that a lot with uh, with the gesso. And what the next step is is that we're going to start to develop now the actual shape of the hills. This time I got the paint a little bit too wet. But what you're going to see happen as you look at this is you're going to see the, the shape of the hill develop. And at the same time the shape of the hill develops, you're going to see the light and shadow interplay. What I've basically done is just put the white gesso over the top of that. So I'm, I'm building basically in layers 
And in building in layers, what you can see is that these things, which once were flat, now seem to start taking on a certain amount of dimension. At least I hope it looks like it's doing that. I'm a little bit nervous, but I think we're doing okay. more of the same color, Dave? Or yeah, this is more of the same color. What I'm basically doing at this point is just working that color up to start bringing it to the kind of golden grassy greens of, you know, the, the, the Napa Valley or, you know, whatever you want it to do. <laughs> What are you actually painting on? Is that a piece of wood or is that uh, That's masonite? That's a piece of masonite. Okay. A piece of masonite. And what I did with that piece of masonite was I cut it up and I put a flat uh, coat of white um, latex paint on it. And then over the top here I did a blue latex paint. What about sheetrock? What about what? Doing this on sheetrock? Uh, you know what, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do it on sheet rock. Okay. Are we going to make clouds? You know what, I don't, I don't paint clouds. Uh, I used to, and I, I, and I can. It just is that I, I don't like painting clouds anymore. I'm going to quote Daryl on his backdrop clinic. Uh, somebody was talking to... Uh, John Allen and asked John Allen if there was anything, am I saying this right, if there was anything about his backdrop that he that he, he didn't like and, and what John Allen said was he didn't like the clouds because the clouds never moved. So I don't, I don't do clouds anymore. Uh, Daryl has a technique that he uses which is called misting and I use the misting now and I'm just very happy with it and I wouldn't go I don't think I would go back to clouds. So you always use the dark areas first and then build up from the dark to the light? Uh, yeah, you know, that's the way I do it. Uh, and that's the way they recommend. They recommend you work from um, from dark to light. Yeah. So you, you, you start by blocking the colors in and then you go from there. Yeah. Now, believe it or not, if you look at that and you say, well, well, yeah, it's not really ready yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that—that's almost ready for for starting your finishing work. Can you just uh, um, briefly uh, explain what the misting in the clouds? What, what are you doing? Yeah, I'd be happy to. What basically misting is is you take your latex blue paint that you use for the sky and take it and mix it about 50/50 with the white gesso. And then you just use a real inexpensive brush, like these 25 cent brushes you can get from Ace or any other hardware store. And you just work that color up. You start down low and you work up like this. And as you work up, the paint just thins out and it just gives the, a nice a nice mist to it. I'll, I'll demonstrate it later if we have time.
Okay, I, I passed out a, a little orange brush and it was going around. Um, that is a, a scholastic um, brush by, by Lowell. This one here is a scholastic brush by Lowell too, but this here is just a lot older. Okay, And the nice thing about these is that the older they get, the better they are for painting your trees. Okay, So if you have an old brush, that's worn and you know kind of stiff and funky. Um, don't get rid of it because you'll really end up liking it. Okay, now what we're going to do your canister stay on it. Oh, the clip in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a clip in the back that holds the canister. Is yeah. that an art tool? Yeah. Okay. It's something you get for like two bucks at the art store. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to start to spot now just our, our oak trees that are up on the hill. And what I'm doing is I'm taking Hooker's Green and putting it down here. I'm putting a little touch of purple into it to give it some darkness and a little bit of the burnt sienna just to warm it a little bit. And then I put too much gesso in it. And that makes it a nice kind of dark green color. Okay? And I would like to have it be a little bit darker, so I'm going to put a little bit more purple in it. Lighten that color just a little bit and go back here. And what did you add to lighten it? Please? White. Whenever you whenever you want to lighten the color, you add white. Whenever you want to darken the color, you add dark or whatever color you're using to darken. You can use a black. I don't recommend black, but you can use black to darken. You can use blue, a dark blue to darken, or you can use a purple to darken.
And if you notice, the only thing I'm doing is dabbing with this. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to make a, a stroke or anything. I'm just dabbing the paint into it to give. To give that illusion of the tree. Normal circumstances, I would probably fill that in more, but I'm not going to. Same size brush, but just I'm stabbing using the harder. same brush. I'm using the same paint combination, and I'm just pressing harder. That's all I'm doing. You're going over the top of the other grain. I'm going right over the top of the other grain. And the reason for that is because it's creating kind of like a dimension. It's giving a little bit of depth to it. Hopefully it's giving a little bit of depth. Are you picking certain spots above the other green or just you know, throughout? No, I'm really just kind of stabbing it on, trying to cover it up a little bit. Okay.
What I'm doing now is trying to give the illusion of some different kinds of trays. Painter's thumb there on your, on your easel yeah. hand. <laughs> so, what colors are you mixing there, Dave? Well, you know what? I'm mixing the same colors. I'm just trying to get it darker. some Mars black to it. We're going to start painting some foreground trees, or not foreground actually, this is still middle distance trees. Threesome uh, typical or what? threesome of trees is that three trees at a time is that very typical or not? Uh, you know what I don't know. I just you know when I'm doing this I just fill up space. Um, I I've always thought that it's best to paint in threes and fives and you know odd numbers instead of even. But happens for me is I take a look at the space and if I'm not happy with the space then I'll paint more into it. If I am happy with it then I'll leave it alone. happening, if you look at it, is that we're moving from light, uh, basically lighter to darker with the trees as they come forward. So that gives you a little bit of the illusion of depth. And then the other thing that needs to happen is that this is pretty bright back here and over here and I need to, I need to work this up and give it more detail. I need to put in more green in here and I need to put in more white and yellow to make it pop out this way a little bit more. What color should you Okay, what I'm doing here is I'm mixing uh, the chromium oxide green with the white gesso and that was just way too much. Differently for uh, concerning the uh, the viewing distance. You what? If the viewer is two feet away, then that be painted different from if the viewer would be six feet away. You know, I've never actually considered that. I just considered what I'm doing on the on the canvas.
okay, now that those trees have had a chance to dry a little bit, can we go back over and highlight them? Did you mix for the highlighter? You know, this is the chromium oxide <coughs> green and the white of that. You know, practically everything I'm doing when I'm painting trees boils down to a dabbing strip. If you do it at home, have the windows open. Have some doors open to the air conditioning button. This is terrible. Man. Outdoors, you get the same kind of problems too with your acrylic drive. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I think when you paint outdoors, you have also have wind adding to that drying effect of your acrylics. Yeah. But right now, I think this is pretty bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what would you start doing now? Is you would start working in your foreground detail. Okay. And your foreground detail would include larger trees, whatever you're going to do on this hill, and stuff like, you know, you know, up in through this area and here. Um, you have to bring some of the other areas out still to pop them out. So are you working with yellow now? Is yeah, I'm right? working with yellow and white. And what I'm trying to do is add enough white to the yellow to lighten it down enough so that it has the have the appearance of sunlight. And I think we pretty much got it here now. Hopefully.
that brings that back hill a little bit more to life. Why you switch brushes? Okay, uh, the reason why I switch the brushes is because now I'm going to try to do a little bit of foreground work and I'm going to try to make it look like there's bushes and um, grass and stuff like that on that hill. Okay? What kind a, of a wider brush? Well, the wider brush works really nice for giving that effect. What happens is when I put something down with this brush, it ends up having a certain amount of texture to it. And that texture, at least in my mind, is what gives the illusion of grasses and, and stuff like that. So that basically is the reason why I like to work with the, with the fan brush while I'm doing that. And what I'll do is I will put several different colors that I've been working with on this hill and you follow the natural contours of the hill itself. Well I'm trying to right at the moment. Okay. the same time. Yeah. I'm finding I've got myself going in two different directions. Now what was the difference that makes you happier now? It was a lighter color. It just brush is starting to work now the way I like it to work. What you do is you make that hill real busy, just using a lot of colors and vary, varying the colors between the yellows and the greens and stuff like that. I have, truthfully, I'm not happy with the way it's turning out. I don't know what's causing it, but I have my suspicions. The 80 degree temperature then may have something to do with it. It has a lot to do with it. It looks good from here, Dave. That's good. I'm happy to hear that. Because from here I'm like, hmm. You know, you're always your own worst critic, anyways. You're a lot closer to it than anybody else is right now. Well, that's true. And it is a backdrop, and on most model railroads, it's going to be three or four feet away, anyway. So, hopefully. Mm -hmm. thing to remember is that it is a backdrop. It is a backdrop. Yeah, absolutely. Of it anyway. yep. Now the thing that you'd want to do on top of this 
has come along. And then a few bushes, there and there. We want to vary the color. One thing I really like, Dave, is the spacing of the trees. I see a lot of backdrops in which people try to cover every square inch of the mountains with yeah, trees. It's not a good idea. Yeah. Not a good idea. At this point, what I would do is I would come along and I would paint some foreground trees in. And once you started painting in your foreground trees, and you have them up in front of all this, um, it would have a tendency to push that back, and it would look, you know, it would look acceptable for a backdrop. I'm going to add a little bit more detail to some of those trees only because I think it leaves them. Now how wide is this piece of uh, huh? masonite you're working? How wide is it? Is this? It about three feet? No, no, I mean this way. Oh, 30 inches. Okay. Yeah, 30 inches. Now what happens is the, the, the more detail the more detail that you can add to your backdrop, actually, the, 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 I think the better it looks. So as you continue to work and develop your trees and develop your hills and stuff like that, um, it just, to me, it just seems to take on a more realistic ground. So you can see this color that I'm putting on is starting to make these trees look like they're even more forward than the other ones. So again, this is just your chromium oxide green with chromium more oxide green, a little, little bit of white mixed into it, and hopefully a little yellow when I remember. You don't have to do a lot of work to a tree to bring it out. Anyway, I think you get the general idea. I think that would. I 
at least give you the idea that you're going to go on the hills or something like that. It's not an easy scene to paint. Uh, it's, it's pretty difficult uh, in regard to color and the blending of color and everything. Whereas if you're doing something like a pine forest or something like that, it's pretty easy because you just got to paint basically with your conifer colors and you can just putting your, your various treetops and going together. Yes? Um, one question talking about color. The, the, the very basic light tan that you have on the left-hand side of your hills there. Uh, I know you did lay, well, not that darker area, but the lighter area. Mm -hmm. uh, up there. Okay. I know you did layers there, but what colors did you use to start with? I, I, okay. The colors that I used to start with were a... Uh, a raw umber, which uh -huh. is this color, uh -huh. and this hill here was painted completely with the raw umber. This was painted on one side with the raw umber, as this one here was. Okay. And then down here, we used the uh, burnt sienna. Okay. Now, for lightening up the, the left-hand side of your hills, what did you use there? Over here, what I used was the uh, yellow okra, okay. uh -huh. and okra, and I used white. Uh -huh. And uh, I also used a little bit of light caddy and yellow. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Just to, to pop it up a little bit. Okay. Five o'clock. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. The other thing you need to do is step back and look at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good, yeah. 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 Y